Introducing touch-free payments from PayPal, a safe way for your customers to pay. Simply download the PayPal app and display your own unique QR code for your customers to scan. Whether you're a market seller, I'll take two tomatoes and a cucumber. Poodle pamperer, <laughs> piano tuner, or plumber. Signing up to accept touch-free payments for your business is easy. Touch-free QR code payments. Shop safe with PayPal. Es mejor llegar tarde a casa que nunca volver a llegar. Es mejor llegar tarde al trabajo que nunca volver a trabajar. Y es mejor recoger tarde a tus hijos que nunca volver a recogerlos. Llegar tarde a donde vayas por esperar a que pase el tren es mucho mejor que arriesgar tu vida tratando de ganarle el paso. Por algo existe el dicho, más vale tarde que nunca. Alto, el tren no para. Mensaje de Nitzel. All right, here we go. Christopher Media, let's make some noise. From Asmacore Studios near Detroit, Michigan, oh, man. it's the Weedsman Podcast. I have no idea what's going on. And now, you have smoked yourself retarded. Here are the Weedsmen. You want to get hot? Oh, it's Easter weekend. It'll be Good Friday when we post this. I'm Chris. I'm Aaron. And what better way to celebrate the death of our Lord and Savior than with getting high? I don't know. <laughs> They're just supposed to commemorate on Good Friday, the day they nailed Jesus to the cross. I've never understood celebrating that. Like, you're supposed to go to church and be sad for three hours because we killed Jesus 2,000 years ago. Right, but he's going to be back in three days, so... <laughs> I was bummed You're me out. You're just going to be back in, ch in church celebrating that he came back. No, like as a kid, it bummed me out because you fucking, it was like the longest time you ever had to go to church. You had to go for like three hours. and Like I made, you know, I had made peace with giving up an hour of my Sunday every week. I didn't care as a kid. But yeah. the three hours once a year for Good Friday, I was like, no, that's a whole <laughs> fucking afternoon. Just, oh, okay. And you have to be in church and you have to be sad. And they're talking about nailing this guy to a cross and then stabbing him in the side and whipping him and putting, like, I'm a child. What are you doing? Why are you showing me all this for? It's fucking torture porn is what yeah, it is. Yeah, it's to scare you into being good. To make it, all to make you just not be an asshole to people. The only thing I ever got out of fucking Good Friday was listening to Jesus Christ Superstar. That was the only good thing that ever came out of Good Friday. It's a tradition that kind of popped up in my house when I was in middle school, and I was okay with it. Because it, 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 what it did is it led me to get a lot of fucking gigs in high school and college and shit that like, yeah. it, it paid for all of my books and, because it, it got me into things like pit bands. Because it showed me like right. hey, guitar can do other things than be in you know, like Led Zeppelin songs. And, right. You know, and... So yeah, and ironically, it was that's what made me retire. It 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 like I don't know when I was like twenty one or twenty two, the community theater, you know that I had done pit bands for finally did Jesus Christ Superstar, and I got to do it. And after that, it's like I'm done. Fucking see you guys later. <laughs> no shit anymore. So I got in this to do. I'm out mainly too because also I was like twenty two and yeah formed a band, but so yeah, Good Friday. I, I always just found it strange. That you just had to like self-flagellate for three hours because a bunch of Jewish people killed a Jewish guy two thousand years ago. Yeah, wait, like I can never get that straight. So the Jews killed Christ, but Christ was a Jew. Yes, I mean not he was Jew. He was Jewish by birth, obviously not by religion. Or I, I don't yes, know. yes, he was eth he was ethnically a Jewish person. Right. And they killed him because they thought he was a false prophet. That's just, I'll just say, they tried to, tried, to, tried to sum it all up, like into the Cliff Notes version. They thought he was a false prophet, so that's why they killed him. And then the whole, how, how come they always used to show the Romans killing him? I mean, that's what I remember, but I never really paid much attention to it. Because they, the uh, they were the ones who ran... Uh, they, uh, 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 Israel was under the Roman rule at the time. Oh, okay. So you went to trial, you went to Rome, and then the Roman judge or emperor, whatever the fuck Pontius Pilate was, right, 
turned it back over to the Jewish people, said, fucking, I'm not handling this shit. You guys, I'm giving back to you, and you guys do what you want. I'm not making this call. And uh, so then they fucking nailed him to a cross. And he apparently had to do all that. I'm not making this up. He had to do all that because Eve ate the apple. <laughs> like, that is... that all is all a woman's fault. <laughs> that is him. Well, it, it's it's it's... Oh man, Jesus Christ, get a hold of this podcast. I'm done. <laughs> but this, it's, it's all about him dying for our quote unquote sins. Right. So because we've done shitty, th- and, it, and it's, it's cause we've done shitty things and it's all tied back to the quote unquote original sin of Eve eating the apple, which I always think the original sin is fucking, but we'll never know. Well, they talk about the, you know, the apple represents knowledge, right? Which is kind of shitty in and of itself that that would be the sin is just to seek to better to know oneself, things. right? But I, I think what they're really talking about that knowledge was was carnal knowledge originally. It was the idea that eating the apple gave I, Eve the idea that hey, there are certain things that we can do in life that are just for pleasure. They don't have to have a purpose. Yes, this app, this apple nourishes me like other things could nourish me, but I picked this apple because I also enjoy eating it. Right? And just the same thing with sex, you know, quote unquote God gave us these the, the ability to reproduce and that's what we should use it for, but also it's just fun. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's that's the original sin, ultimately, fucking for pleasure, not to conceive a child. And that's why they nailed Jesus to the cross. And that's why a chocolate bunny brings you eggs in the night. The first Sunday after the first full moon of spring. Right. Did, well, did that's you know a, that that's, that's how Easter's determined? I know, well, like, full-grown no. adults, people who are older than me, that are like, why does Easter move every year? Like, really? We... By forty something, we haven't researched this. Like it's. I just never paid enough attention to even give a shit. <laughs> but it, yeah, I mean, like, like the rest of the calendar, it? the Romans said it, and they chose for Easter instead of it. Like at least Christmas is fixed, right? Halloween is fixed, mm-hmm. right? Thanksgiving is. F- oh no, Thanksgiving rotates. But it, well, yeah, but it's always Thursday. on a Thursday. It's a specific. Yeah, it's Thursday. always the last Thursday in November. Right. Yeah, you know, even yeah, even election day, like yeah, but Easter is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the odd uh, uh, vernal equinox. Yeah, which is another thing that points to paganism, right? Which, uh, which is why Easter has always confounded me so much because, like, I understand that that core story of Jesus, you know, on the cross and. And I don't know, they throw him in a cave and then he comes back to life and he comes out. But all of the things that we use to symbolize Easter and celebrate it are all from paganism. Yeah. And the fucking well, bunny I guess not, and all that. Not shit all of them. Too. Like the the rabbit. Uh, well, I don't know if that it come, if the rabbit thing comes from paganism. It's, but it, yeah, it I mean, most of it. I remember it's. I, it's trust me. It's going to be in the news uh, soon here in the next couple of days. Someone, it, it, it'll it'll show up in Google News. Why is there a rabbit associated with Easter? And we'll right. we'll find out. But ultimately, the answer is because the church was really good at marketing. And yes. why in why wholly invent a, a new myth from cloth when you can take the elements around you and recombine them? And people go, oh yeah, I've heard of this whole egg thing and the rabbit and. What is that all about anyway? Well, actually, it comes from Christianity, you know, and that's how you hook them. You give them a story that they're already familiar with, but just put a new twist on it. Easter was also a day my rich friends got extra gifts. And in that respect, it's no different than QAnon. You know, QAnon is just going, hey, there's all this stuff going on. We're just going to all, we're going to put it all in association with one group of people all the bad stuff that's going on in the world and create a boogeyman. By the way, I can't say the phrase vernal equinox without thinking of the Simpsons episode where Homer uh, took the vocabulary. He thought he was doing weight loss, but he was 
of building his vocabulary <laughs> and sleep. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. Just, it just one. It's just, it's it's a one-off line, but every time I say it, I hear all. It's Lisa. Hey, do you know what today is? Homer goes the vernal equinox. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't remember that one. <laughs> For some reason, it's 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 one of those dumb things. I always I always think of that whenever I say or read or say the phrase vernal equinox. And then he I, and yeah, I've up, got it. When he stopped doing the vocabulary, that's where he came. Hey, Marge, where's that metal dealie? That you use <laughs> to dig food. <laughs> like, it got worse. Oh, so what's been going on lately? Everyone's been talking about the Suez Canal, I guess. Yeah, like boat we're, all, we're all deeply invested in this boat that was stuck in the mud for a week. I was not. Yeah. I could have. You talk about one story I never clicked on, that one. There is a boat stuck. Who cares? I, mean, right. I heard something today on one of the podcast list. They're saying the effects of this will be felt for years. Really? Will they? Really? I think anything. I think anything that got shorted from this thing being blocked will probably be air shipped and made up. Yeah, I mean, well, there's still cost involved in that. You know, I, I don't know. I can. I understand like that. It it definitely fucked things up for a lot of people. But, look, you know, the price of goods will go up for a little bit and they'll make up their money on it real quick mm-hmm. and things will go back to normal, you know? Actually, the only thing I learned in all of this was that the Statue of Liberty was a re-gift. Right. Is France it was tried a- to give it to Egypt for the Suez Canal and Egypt was like, nah, we want this. <laughs> Now what? <laughs> yeah. Hey, United States, you want this? Sure. So there you go, yeah. everybody. Yeah. The Statue well, of Liberty is oh, regifted. This, this is really nice, but why she got so much eyeliner? Yeah. Why she look was, like? Why she dress like Cleopatra? Right. <laughs> yeah. Or, originally, instead of carrying a torch, she just had her. I can't even describe it. What you know the the Egyptian dance that they do, like on the Bengals video. <laughs> oh. Oh. Where you make your arm like a snake and you kind of jab yeah, it. Yeah, you walk like an Egyptian. Yeah, you walk like an Egyptian. That's what she was doing. Oh, the, are the Bengals canceled yet? <laughs> oh, wait wait till Gen Z hears walk like an Egyptian. Oh, that's it. Susanna Hoffs, run. Run now. Well, that's the thing is that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be lambasted for racism. They would be criticized for appropriation. Yep. Still cancelable though. Because it's okay to say that Egyptians walk in a certain way. You just can't You can't mimic it. Adopt it. Yeah. If you if you mimic it or try to adopt that. And no one in that video was fucking Egyptian either. <laughs> <laughs> Which we don't have walk like an Egyptian if you don't if Steve Martin doesn't do King Tut, right? Oh, Didn't that come out first. Man. He just better die before Gen Z finds that out. <laughs> but I, I don't know. Like we were really obsessed with uh, with Egyptian culture, ancient yeah. Egyptian culture, I should say, in the eighties. And this idea of walking like an Egyptian, even though, like, do you think that anybody walked like that? Like, no. There was they, they drew pictures of people doing that. It doesn't mean that that's how they went everywhere. I think that that. That song was clearly a byproduct of the MTV age. If there aren't music videos, that song never gets made. Yep. Because it wouldn't translate well to radio. Like, what the fuck are they talking about? Yeah, that's right. You kind of have to have the, the visual element to sell it. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, there is definitely a, a part of the video, the MTV age that brought back the idea of dance crazes, or at least tried to you know oh yeah well i mean yeah yeah what one where we were involved in at least our age group the fucking macarena good yes. god the macarena <laughs> well still even still the fucking uh when i was djing in bars uh the fat girl dance the cupid shuffle what <laughs> i don't know if i know that one you never heard the cupid shuffle 
I I don't think so. Why once is it called the fat, fat chicks girl in dance? A bar, <laughs> once you see a bunch of fat chicks in a bar line dance, put on the cupid show. Ah, now that's probably like music for old people, or it could still be a thing. I don't know, but it was definitely yeah. But I get what you're saying. And what else in the '90s besides the Macarena? Well, I know in the late '80s, uh, because of Love Shack, it cre- the fucking line dance for weddings. People had to do that shit because of the video. Wait, they would li- they would line dance to Love well, Shack. It wasn't well, different form of line dance. It was everybody would line up like the video, oh, and then like, people would go down the middle of them. Yeah, like uh, Soul Train style. Yes, that so it brought the Soul Train dance back into popularity, or at least made it okay for white people to dance yes. awkwardly down brought it the to aisle. White, brought the Soul Train dance to white people. Yeah. Because you don't get much wider, much wider than Fred, uh, whatever the fuck his name is, from the B-52s, for, yeah. uh, Schneider. Like, he definitely is like top five that of whitest guys ever. You don't get whiter than Fred Schneider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, is Schneider a Jewish name? It is. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, you definitely have your Jefferson's, Lenny Kravitz type situation. Sure. <laughs> I heard his real name is Lenny Schneider. But, oh, Kravitz? No, it's, it's a joke. What? Oh, okay. I, <laughs> sorry. It's like, right I changed my head. name from Jewish to Jewier. Uh, right. <laughs> okay. Schneider wasn't Jewish enough. I'm changing it to Kravitz. Well, we finally got that Snyder cut. I know you, you were think? excited. <laughs> yeah. It's another movie for me to now watch. Put the, <laughs> let me not put that in my Netflix queue. The best news uh, about the Snyder Cut for you was that you were saving four and a half hours by not watching it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I've, heard. I've, heard it's, I've heard the word of mouth on it is good. Is it, it is good? really good. Yeah, it's very enjoyable. I mean, it's definitely like super bloated and too long, but it works. I mean, it tells an actual cohesive story, which is something that the first one completely failed to do. And yeah, I mean, I was I was surprised about how much I enjoyed it. Honestly, I don't think that I was that excited for any other DC project uh, watching it. Not leading up to it. Leading up to it, I was like, well, we'll see. You know, I I hadn't seen a lot of evidence from what was released of of Zack Snyder's material that you know that gave me a whole lot of confidence. But clearly this shows that the studio involvement can just totally kill a project. And it's interesting, some of the stories that are coming out of the uh, the post-Snyder Cut era, I guess. One of them being that Patty Jenkins, when she was directing the first Wonder Woman movie, originally that story was written as uh, Wonder Woman you know, comes to the human world, sees war, blames it on Ares, tracks down Ares, never finds him, realizes that men are just bad, right? They, they just sometimes do bad things and they make war and she can't, it's not attributable to some evil god. And the studio didn't like that. They're like, well, no, we still need to have the god show up and have a big CGI battle. And as a result, we had a Wonder Woman movie that seemed to have a, you know, a really good tone and a and a nice plot and a really good story going through it that ends up in this really weird cgi battle in the middle of nowhere because they they had to cobble it all together it take the the big boss battle takes place on an empty airfield on a foggy night (laughs) so they pretty much just had no set and they were just like all right gal why don't you jump around for a little bit? We'll film that, and then we'll splice in the the bad guy. So uh, what, what we're what, what we're learning is: wait, when you let directors direct, they make good shit. What? Yeah, or at least cohesive shit. You can't you know, make like, a movie by committee. Come on. I mean, I I, well, you. I mean, it takes a lot of people to make a movie, right? And you do have to have. 
you know, some buying. You can't, I don't think that there's a whole lot of successful stories of like, I'm mean, sure there's plenty of auteurs who like seem driven and they make the, what people consider great art, but they still need the buy in from the people around them. And if they, what they don't get in what you normally would get it uh, from a person by being nice to them and treating them like a human, uh, when that la- is lacking, I think you get buy-in from, well, I want to be part of this successful thing. I want to be, I, you know, you're, people are very forgiving of artists. They say, well, you know, he's a brilliant director and, and uh, you know, he's got his vision. So we just do whatever he, he or she says. But you, you still need to some sort of buy-in into the project of people being fully invested in it to make a good movie. And Absolutely. And, and yeah, I, I think we've seen that like most of the stuff that we've gotten from DC is has got, you know, a big old thumbprint from the studio right on top of it. It's just glaringly obvious now where, you know, uh, where they're fucking up. Well, yeah, I mean, take a cue from uh, it, it, it looks like Marvel lets their directors make their movies. Yeah. And Marvel has a <clears throat> they have a structure that actually resembles more. Uh, well, not just comics, but a lot of other publishing. And they have essentially, like, editors. <clears throat> Kevin Feige is, like, the editor for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So he's an actual creative person who, you know, knows all this shit, can do all this shit, and he's the one making the, the bigger decisions, not the... I mean, I'm sure the studio has themselves have input... But when you have a track record like this, you know, you have also a lot of uh, power to tell the studio to fuck off every once in a while. But well, <clears throat> it's, now they didn't remove Snyder, right? He left. He had some family stuff, so they brought in Joss Whedon to finish it. Well, yeah, but it sounded like the relationship was already on the rocks, and. You know, it could have been a situation where, you know, he he finished the project regardless. But I, it sounds more like it was a bad working condition combined with a family tragedy that was like, I don't need this. You know, if it was a good working experience, it might have actually been good for him to have something to kind of throw yourself into. I can, Didn't I can only close to him kill themselves. Or well, his like daughter, that? his daughter committed yeah. suicide. Right. Yeah. So like, I can't imagine what that would be like. And I'm not trying to say that I could, you know, understand like that. I'm, I'm not trying to divine his intentions out of this, but all I can say is that when you experience a tragedy like that and you can't do anything about it, but grieve the things that you can get lost in are, you know, can, uh, can be helpful to you, you Mm -hmm. know? And I think if this was a project that he was fully invested in and had a good relationship with the studio, then he could have sought it. He could have saw the thing through, but that wasn't the case. And he had already at that point, I believe presented a two hour version of the, of the movie that he, he didn't like and the studio didn't like. So he was already sent back to the drawing board. They were already going to do reshoots. And at that point, I think, is when he walked away from it and said, you know, let, why don't you just find somebody that will put together the movie that you want? I've got my family to think of right now. Now, how did this come about? The, the new version? I mean, strictly through the, the force of social media and, you know, people organizing to make it known that they wanted to see Zack Snyder's original vision Mm -hmm. and they were annoying and they wouldn't shut up about it. And I was like, I, you know, I I don't know what kind of gold you expect to be there, but uh, look, I admit it. I was wrong. The original version is well worth watching. I started watching it again with my kids and I'm enjoying it the second time through even more. And apparently now this is causing a rift at, HBO Max and between them and and the parent company AT and T because you know they now HBO Max now has like this thing that's super successful right people are yeah. 
talking about it like, wow, we're, we're actually surprised how good it is. And, you know, when, when it's successful, and especially when it's a franchise like this, people expect to see more. Plus, there's a good chunk of this movie that is just devoted to setting up other stories. There's a whole half hour after the, after the main story wraps that involves new characters popping up, uh, premonitions of alternate timelines and, and, you know, a whole mess of, of new stories that they could tell. Now, that would be, that would hinge on you having, to, you know, the, the buy in of Ben Affleck and Gal Gadot and Jason Momoa and Henry Cavill, all these people who could get work just about anywhere right now. So that might be a tough call, but also that means that like if you do do a Snyderverse separately, maybe just an HBO Max exclusive and make more movies or even a TV show with these characters, where does that leave the main studio's characters? You know, Gal Gadot has been a really successful Wonder Woman. So if she's going to be part of the Snyderverse, which I don't think would happen, but that's what you know, people are, are talking about right now. Does that mean that they find a different Wonder Woman for for the other, you know, main theatrical releases? That would be tough to convince AT&T to give up their current, you know, box office. Well, you know, the last one didn't really bust the box office, but there wasn't really a box office to bust. But regardless of its quality, I'm sure it would have done very well for Warner Brothers in the theaters. And, yeah, I mean, that's what... What else do they have to hinge on? I mean, unless this Robert Pattinson version of Batman is going to be really successful, maybe they have their new franchise. But I guess we'll see what happens. They call them Battenton? Battenton Man? Are they? <laughs> are, no, they are they doing it? Or they you should. Did you just make that up? Because that's pretty good. I like it. Turning a phrase. It's Battenson. Yes, yeah, you had Batfleck, right? Right. I was. Tra- what What was his character's name in Twilight? Oh, what the fuck? Because everyone would talk about oh, like, uh, are you a uh, Edward? Okay, yeah, that doesn't really work, does it? Batward? Oh, there maybe. Batward's got know. a good ring to it. A lot of superhero nerdy shit coming out this weekend, though. Or well, I guess now would be last weekend as this show releases, but there was uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier came out, uh, Invincible, new animated superhero-based show on Amazon Prime, based on the comic book by Robert Kirkman of The Walking Dead. And uh, Oh, and I also watched something that I never would have watched unless somebody you know pointed out to me that it might be good, an animated show on Netflix called... I'm not sure if you pronounce it Dota or D O T A. Actually the full I, title the full title is Dota Dragon's Blood. And it's some kind of fantasy cartoon. I mean it's you know total Dungeons and Dragons shit. Big dragons and guys with swords and but it's also it's a little bit adult. It's like uh pretty violent. Is it animated Game of Thrones? Yeah. It it pretty much is. Uh, they don't do Full on nudity in it, but other than that, yeah, it pretty much is animated Game of Thrones. Yet, with nudity. Yeah, yet. yet. Yeah. And that Invincible cartoon is like super graphic, which I wasn't sure if they were going to go that far with it. I've read the entire Invincible series and quite enjoyed it. And it's it's a story about a, a the son of a superman type superhero an alien with super strength and flies around and it kind of starts out like a more wholesome traditional superman story but it goes very violent <laughs> like in, in, it escalates there's a, quickly there's a bit of a twist at the end of the first episode that uh i don't want to spoil for anybody but just be known that this isn't going to be a traditional Superman, you know, classic golden age comic book type of story. This is the story about what really happens when a man with that can, you know, move planets punches you in the face. Yeah. And it's not Al. Your face it's collapses. Not a, it's not a 
black eye, it's like you have no head. Yeah. That's how physics works. That's how it would really go down. Yep. So I've been really enjoying that. They dropped three episodes. I got through all three of those. And uh, I can't wait to see what... Because, like I said, they've been very true to the comics. This is the closest I've ever seen any kind of adapted comic book material resemble the the original without without it being a fault. You know, you still have to... It's a different medium for telling stories, so you can't just take a comic book story and put it on a screen. But this is as close as you can get to that. I'll tell that to Marvel. Well, you know, Marvel succeeds on getting... Marvel does it through making sure that they give you the quote-unquote splash pages. And that used to be like an editorial directive from Marvel. There was a certain way that you drew your characters and a certain way that you plotted your story. And part of that involved opening up with a splash page, a full page, you know, no panels on it, just one image that shows, you know, your big monster and your heroes and action and all that. So that's why a lot of uh, the, that that uh, that form of storytelling eventually influenced all the action movies that we have today. Because remember, like, 80s action movies like Rambo and Commando and shit like that, like, they'd build up to the shit, right? Mm-hmm. You'd get the story of, like, what's going on with these people. Somebody gets kidnapped. Somebody gets into some trouble. They start gearing up. And then you're like, you know, you're 20 minutes into the movie. You're like, fuck yeah, he's strapping on the guns. Let's get to let's get to work. Nowadays, action movies, you got to start off with an action piece. Oh, yeah, something has to be blowing up in the first scene. Yeah. So in the comics, you'd have this big splash page that would be, you know, your big opening scene. But then that would be, uh, that would just be foreshadowing. You know, the next page would be like two days earlier, and there's Mister Fantastic and Ben Grimm in the in you know Fantastic Four Tower, and uh, and they'd build up to that that big battle. So, what? Uh, why did I, oh, in the Marvel movies, they just make sure that they give you some of those. Just big scenes. They do it really well, especially in Guardians. They show you those big shots of space looking totally not like what any outer space looks like anywhere in reality, but it definitely looks like a Jack Kirby Marvel, you know, drawing. It's space somewhere. Yeah. It's it's, it's space as you imagined it as a kid, not as, as it was... Just uh, portrayed in Star Trek, a bunch of white dots, you know? There's fucking purple clouds and huge planets way too close to each other. and Asteroids. Yeah. Shit zipping around. Kirby crackle all over the place. I mean, William Shatner's not up there? That, uh, the Falcon and Winter Soldier's pretty good, too. Is Chris that, Evans in it? No. Um, so who's going to be Captain America? Does it answer that question? Yeah, well, I think that's we're going to get the answer to that question in this show. Actually, they they do handle they do hand over the mantle. The government gives the shield to uh, John Walker, who in the comics is called U.S. Agent, um, but in this they're just straight up calling him Captain America, and that's actually played by Wyatt Russell, which is Kurt Russell's son, who also played the Marvel villain. Uh, Ego, the living planet, in the second. Was it supposed to be uh, a black guy? Guardians. What happened? What? Wasn't it supposed to be a black guy? What happened? Wasn't it supposed to be a black? Oh, who? Captain America? Yes. Well, so Captain, when Captain America uh, did whatever he did, it, I can't remember, like died or just went to an alternate timeline or became old or something. He's on vacation. When he when he gave up the mantle, he gave it to Sam Wilson, who is Falcon and who is Black. So yes, that's probably why you heard that Captain America was going to be a a, a Black person. But at the beginning of the series, Sam introducing touch free payments from PayPal, a safe way for your customers to pay. 
Simply download the PayPal app and display your own unique QR code for your customers to scan. Whether you're a market seller, I'll take two tomatoes and a cucumber. Poodle pamperer, <laughs> piano tuner, or plumber. Signing up to accept touch-free payments for your business is easy. Touch-free QR code payments. Shop safe with PayPal. Me, 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 but also you. The Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Pip 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 Powder Donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name and price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Es mejor llegar tarde a casa que nunca volver a llegar. Es mejor llegar tarde al trabajo que nunca volver a trabajar. Y es mejor recoger tarde a tus hijos que nunca volver a recogerlos. Llegar tarde a donde vayas por esperar a que pase el tren es mucho mejor que arriesgar tu vida tratando de ganarle el paso. Por algo existe el dicho, más vale tarde que nunca. Alto, el tren no para. Mensaje de Nietzsche. Introducing touch-free payments from PayPal, a safe way for your customers to pay. Simply download the PayPal app and display your own unique QR code for your customers to scan. Whether you're a market seller, I'll take two tomatoes and a cucumber. Poodle pamperer, <laughs> piano tuner, or plumber. Signing up to accept touch-free payments for your business is easy. Touch-free QR code payments. Shop safe with PayPal. Es mejor llegar tarde a casa que nunca volver a llegar. Es mejor llegar tarde al trabajo que nunca volver a trabajar. Y es mejor recoger tarde a tus hijos que nunca volver a recogerlos. Llegar tarde a donde vayas por esperar a que pase el tren es mucho mejor que arriesgar tu vida tratando de ganarle el paso. Por algo existe el dicho, más vale tarde que nunca. Alto, el tren no para. Mensaje de Nietzsche. Gives his reasons for why he can't take over the mantle of Captain America. He gives the shield to a museum and the government ends up saying, nah, that's not how this shit works. That's a government asset. And we've it got somebody else. In museum. Yeah. Which and interestingly, so. both the, both WandaVision and, uh, the Falcon and Winter Soldier show, their plots hinge on, the government trying to reboot these characters that have died off. So in, in uh, WandaVision, the, gover the government re uh, recovers Vision's body and puts it back together and make a new and, and like basically reboot it. It doesn't have any of the original Vision personality, but it's still, uh, you know, an Android weapon. And, yeah, and in Falcon and Winter Soldier, the government assigns Captain America to a totally different person. And it didn't stick with, uh, well, I, actually, I don't know what ultimately happened with uh, the rebooted or white vision from WandaVision. I'm sure it's not going to stick with uh, with Falcon and Winter Soldier, but who knows? I mean, maybe this will be our new Captain America. But it's not just interesting because it's a coincidence. It's interesting because those are, I don't know, I don't, I don't have this fully mapped out, but like, there's something going on here with what Marvel's trying to say is, like, no, ultimately, nobody else can do these characters the way that we can. Like, beware of knockoff superheroes. I think is the message <laughs> of the Marvel TV shows. You know, everybody's doing their own version of superheroes, whether they're, they've got their own, you know, classic properties or they're, they've got their own take on it. I'm doing an edgy Superman. I'm doing, you know, a more realistic Batman or something like that. And I think that's ultimately Marvel's message is like, these are all B rate heroes. And this is what happens when you have B rate heroes. Here's how you do this shit. Right. Yeah. We are Marvel. That's I, I honestly think that I'm not trying to say it like it's insidious, but I think that that's part of their intention. 
Say that we are the only ones who can do superheroes right. That's the message of these two shows. So speaking of doing things right, there's some people that are trying to do right by cannabis. Others say it's not about so that much. Time. Talk about the reefer. It is. Well, there's uh, you know, we've talked forever now about possible uh, and what looked like impending legalization in New York, but finally, uh, looks like they they're, they're going to be reaching a deal to legalize recreational cannabis. Uh, welcome to the party. There you go. There's the East Coast Domino. Let, yep. Get and on board. It, the rest of everything else that touches the Atlantic Ocean. And all it took was for Cuomo to need something else to talk about. <laughs> right? <laughs> he did not want to see another headline about something that he did. He wanted to see something that had his name in the in there. That was a good thing. It did. You know, the Bloomberg uh, headline on this is, New York pot legalization gets fast track on Cuomo dash lawmaker deal. So they're giving him credit. Like, hey, before I get impeached, I'll give you weed. Yeah, that's fine. That that could be your last good deed because I think that's what it's going to be. So they're they're looking at a deal to legalize for anyone twenty one and up that uh, includes a thirteen percent sale t- sales tax. Uh, nine of that would go to the state, and 4% would actually go to what they call in, in this Bloomberg story localities. Oh, so like I boroughs. Guess, right. Distributors additionally would collect an excise tax of as much as 3% per milligram of THC. Yeah, it's going to be like California East as far as prices. Yeah, hey, we get that cartridge. All right, seventy five dollars. But that's interesting. I don't. I don't but know it says 40. that I've. Yeah, <laughs> I. I don't know that we've ever heard of uh, a program that taxes based on the potency, though. <sighs> Everyone's always got to try to leave their stink on something. Like, why are you yeah. going to try to be difficult, in New York? Right. Well, yeah, these the lawmakers have to make it look like they're actually doing their job and their job is hard, even though, you know, legalizing cannabis is not difficult. No. Over 20% of the country has already done it. There you go. Call up one of your neighboring state friends that have legalized it. Ask them for tips. So I, I can't see that they're putting out a timeline for how quickly they expect to get this passed, but they do say that they uh, once passed that they would uh, hope to have this operation up and running within a year. Yeah. We need to get this going before Cuomo gets impeached. Let's go. Uh, yeah, well, that's that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's their timeline. Well, no, didn't it actually start? It started in the legislature, though, right? And he's just going to, he's agreed to sign it. Yeah. Uh, n- he will probably sign it before he can be impeached. And I think that's the idea is definitely like, hey, no, look, I'm still doing good things. Yeah, look, I give you the weed. Plus, he, he probably wants to put the message out there that he's a pretty chill dude, right? <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, those stories about me, that's not the real me. No. He's going to be I'm doing press ABC. conferences. Crank up a J. He's chilling. He's doing press conferences with fucking black light Jimi Hendrix posters behind him. <laughs> yeah, the Bob Marley poster everybody has. Yeah. I think it was issued to college dorm rooms when I was in college. Like it just came, you know, they gave it to you at orientation. Yep. They're like, which one you want, the Bob Marley or the Einstein? <laughs> Some of the renegades would go, both. <laughs> Those are the people who lived in the, the attached suites. They had the room to do that. So, progress in New York. But if we're hoping that there's going to be progress federally, uh, I don't know if I'd hold your breath on that one. I mean, on, not, from the way, not from the messages that the White House is telegraphing so far, like firing five people who tested positive, uh, f- five people who worked in the White House that tested po- positive for cannabis. Pot's legal in Washington D.C. What the fuck are they? What do they think's going to happen? 
Yeah, well, but the White House is not Washington, D.C., right? That's federal po- property. Wait, it's like the Vatican. It's its own sovereign little nation. Yeah, I'm not sure how that works, actually. Yeah, But, you know, this was earlier in the year. They had actually been talking about how cannabis wouldn't be an issue. It wouldn't preclude somebody from having a job at the White House. Something that they didn't have to come out and talk about. So, I don't know. I mean, it's a possibility that this story is nothing. Because it it could just be that they let a certain number of people go, and they also happen to have tested positive for cannabis. That being said, then, why were, why are they even testing for cannabis if, it, if they don't see it as an issue? So I don't know. I mean, it could just be that everybody at the White House smokes pot, right? <laughs> That's true. People got people a little too free after the election. The White House goes, no, no, wait, guys, remember, we're government. Yeah. And Snoop Dogg is showing up to burn with Joe. Maybe I, uh, if I was to put on my rose-colored glasses, uh, I could see this as being the Biden administration actually positioning themselves to do something federally on cannabis. Because if you want to actually get it done, I don't think you can do it by going, hey, man, like, What's the big deal? You know, Look, you man, have to... I had to fire four people. This is an outrage. Right. Well, no, I'm saying more like, you know, the, if the if the Biden administration is going to be responsible for legalizing cannabis federally, and they want to sell that as a, a message and not come off as liberal wackos, then they have to handle it as like, well, this is inevitable. Uh, this is something that its time has come. And we just want to do the right thing and we don't want to, you know, persecute people unnecessarily. That being said, we're still really against blah, 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 blah. You know, kids using it, uh, uh, abusing drugs in general, the possibility of it being a gateway drug. If the Biden administration pushes on this at all, if they do move forward on it, we're going to hear all the usual bullshit along with it. Because they they need to hedge their bets on it. It's not it's not as divisive as an issue as it once was, but it's difficult for the the administration to put forward anything that's going to be seen as divisive because he ran on a platform of reunifying the country. So if they are, like, I can see if they are looking to make a move on it, this is actually how they would do it. First, make sure that they were completely clean. Yeah. We played that being said, I could, I, could, I could be totally wrong on this. And, you know, any, any hints toward being lenient on or even legalizing cannabis has just been them playing us. Or do we know what positions these people were? Like, you know, if they were like at some high security positions, like I might agree with it. You know, but if these were like some cooks, if these are like some cooks in the kitchen, I'd be like, "What do you expect? They're cooks." Yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't know why you would even test a cook. This is like the head of Secret Service. I mean, all right, maybe you you want to you'd you want that guy pretty sharp. Yeah, but I think Secret Service is like its own thing. This would just be like White House employees. I don't know. I was. Seeing if I could actually... one of them the guy that used to bring Donald Trump the Diet Cokes? The five you know officials... That? That, what's that? Did you know Trump had a Diet Coke button? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the five officials Ms. P- uh, Saki mentioned on Friday had been directed to resign in part because of marijuana use, according to a person familiar with the matter, but who was not authorized to speak publicly. Several, several in that group also had other disqualifying factors that surfaced when determining their eligibility to receive jobs in the administration. Hmm. Trying to process that language. What is she really saying? What were the jobs? Do we know? Yeah, I don't know. I I can't find anything on the actual positions. It does say that about a dozen administration officials had been directed to work remotely until they had been cleared to meet a new standard of past marijuana use set by the White House. So 
I th- it sounds like they were like, why don't you work from home until you can piss clean? <laughs> Probably. I mean, yeah, I, though I guess it is tricky with it, with it being the White House, but yeah, it could just be President Grandpa, like no weed. Well, well yeah, it's not his well, rules. He's, he's not running look, them. If if I had a job at the White House, I mean, it's a pretty well paying gig and probably something you'd want to hang on to. And uh, you know, any kind of government gig like that is usually pretty cushy. And like, regardless of what I did on my off time, like I would hide all of that shit from my employer. I'd be I'd be, uh, I'd have a monkey dick for sure if I worked at the White House. Oh, wow. You know, the monk, the monkey dick, you know, the monkey dick. Yeah, that's the, the fake dick that you buy to fill with urine, somebody else's urine that's clean. Oh, the Wizinator? I never heard it called a monkey dick. Well, the Wizinator, I think, is like a device that you can, you know, put, put in your underwear or down your pants or something like that and, and simulate peeing but the monkey dick looks like looks like an actual dick and actually has the urine come out of the urethra of the fake dick never heard it called monkey dick oh yeah that's the thing i'm not googling that you coward <laughs> uh, yeah i don't want to uh, bizarre red penis monkey yeah. 195 Monkey penis stock photos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> New monkey with unusual penis discovered. Oh, boy. Urban Dictionary says it's a penis that is long but skinny or thin. <laughs> <laughs> Poor monkeys. Is that how you're hung? <laughs> thin. The long ass arms and then thin ass dicks. We're known for our thin penises. <laughs> you can get. Cannabis mailed directly to your house legally, but it, it has almost no THC. Well, then you're not getting cannabis. Yeah. In my book. And it's called Dad Grass. Organic CBD hemp flower. It says so low, you- dose, low dose full toke like your parents used to smoke. I mean, I don't think they smoked shit that bad. No. I know, I know it wasn't we- as strong as... But this, let's see, do they act? I mean, it's got to be really low THC for them to, uh, 0.3% THC. No, that's not like shit our parents used to smoke. That shit was probably closer to like 10%. Yeah, that, yeah but I don't know. Like, they, they, didn't there used to actually really be a lid? Like, it was like a garbage can lid full? I, I don't know what like you're saying. Say, I'm scoring a lid. Was it maybe the weed was well, that shitty? No, a lid was like... I don't know how big a lid was. I don't know why. Why did they call it a lid? I was always told it was it was a garbage can lid size. But I was like, that's a lot of fucking weed. I don't think it was. What's a lid? 420 Magazine. Uh, someone says... Oh, it's not... Contrary to popular belief, a lid is not an ounce of weed. Coffee cans had a key like a sardine can, and the lid would be wound off the can. The lid is used to measure. The lid used to measure usually contained about four fingers of pot. <laughs> People at the time didn't have a triple scale to weigh pot. Okay, so there we go. Not a garbage can lid. A coffee can lid. Yeah, but it's not the lid. It's the actual coffee can. I don't know. Well, now we have dispensaries, so it doesn't matter. And fuck this dad grass. Point three. Yeah. Get your dog I'm, high. I'm going to ask my dispensary for a lid and see what they give me. <laughs> Let me get a lid, man. Yeah. They give me a baseball cap with their logo. Guy goes and gets his manager. I don't know what he's talking about. What do I give him? You want to buy a lid to one of our jars, sir? There's a local restaurant in Detroit that posted recently on their Facebook, the Caucus Club Detroit. They wrote, business casual is the minimum dress code and should be adhered to while dining. Going on to say, uh, you know, baseball caps, hoodies, sneakers, none of this stuff is, is appropriate. And then saying, most importantly, if you smell like marijuana, don't even think of stepping inside the Caucus Club. Please be mindful that strong, quote-unquote, odors are unacceptable. 
I mean, that's a stance, and he's taking it. He's, he's allowed to. He's not a public, you know. He's not a. He's not a government building. Be like, hey, I don't want it because if you know anything about the caucus club, it's a, isn't it a high end, fancy schmancy, yeah, highfalutin. Yeah, yeah. Why, I mean, I wouldn't. I would go there high, sure, but I would, I would vape or something. You know, I wouldn't go in yeah. there reeking of weed. Hey, I'm high. And I'm, let's go to the caucus club. I guess this was based on complaints that, that they got that some of their customers. Uh, he says it's so pungent that some have commented it smells like you're seated next to a dead skunk. It stings the nostrils. Hey, who ordered the skunk? I'd be more mad they didn't share. Like, hey, man, you couldn't call me outside? We're all eating dinner. Yeah, no shit. I don't know what I think about this story. There was a, apparently in Oklahoma City, there was two people hospitalized after eating THC edibles. And they refer to them in this story on Coco News, K-O-C-O, Channel 5, ABC. They refer to it as uh, out-of-state THC products because they have a California logo on it. So they have the little triangle with the cannabis symbol in it, and then it says CA underneath. The thing about these products, though, is that... So these are chips, which I... Have you ever had THC-infused chips of any sort? I have not. I, I don't would. know how they would... I mean, I would too, but how would you do that? Maybe the oil you try yeah, it? Maybe. It seems like a very inefficient way to infuse cannabis. But that, I mean, I'm sure it's totally possible. But also, if you look at, I sent you the link for this story, and it's got a picture of the products on there, and it's Ruffles, Doritos, and Fritos. And it's not like they took the logo and, and messed with it. They just straight up printed a Fritos bag. And, or what if they're used? What if they fish them out of the trash? Ew. Yeah. Well, it does look, if you look at the picture closely, you can see that they're resealable bags. So... It's not just a chip bag, but it definitely has the actual, like, Ruffles logo and the Doritos logo. Like, it's made to look like the actual product, not a, not a THC knockoff of that chip. So I don't know how you can sell that in California legally. Uh, apparently you can't. Well, it says it's Oklahoma where these are... Yeah, so it wouldn't be legal to sell, in, and it would be really difficult to get away with it too, because you're—I mean—you're going up against a major corporation, putting their logo on something that you're selling at a store anywhere. I mean, they're going to find out about it. So well, I don't know. This, Frito Lay's going to find out too, and then double whammy. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, Frito Lay being the—that's that, what I was talking about. But um, yeah, I—I I don't know. I think this is somebody's uh, false flag op, honestly. You know, they, they made these up, slapped a California logo on it, and said, look at what these liberals are letting leak into our, our fine state. Yeah. They took our jam. Coming in here, they're bringing their weed, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime. Hey, think what you want about the man. He had quotable speeches. The quotes may not have necessarily been good. Oh, Trump? Yeah. Yeah, it's very quotable. These Californians infecting, <laughs> bring their liberal hippie chips. Like, the thing, if edibles like that existed, I'd be all over that shit. What, chips and weed together? Yeah. It just doesn't make sense, though. Like, how would somebody make these and think they could get away with it? And then what do they do with them? Anybody they tried to, any retailer they tried to sell them to, they're like, I can't sell that. Hey, you got your Doritos and my cannabis. Hey, you got your cannabis and my Doritos. I mean, they get into enough trouble as it is just trying to package it, package the product like a regular snack. You know, because, well, kids will think it's just a treat. Yeah, we got to like, but then, but then to actually disguise it as like, yeah, these same people will tell you that, and then look at how they packaged uh, hard seltzer. At this point, it's, they're marketing alcohol to teenagers. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, we don't want the edibles to be too brightly colored. But yeah, I think this was an inside job. I think this is somebody 
probably in the the police department in Oklahoma somewhere, like I don't know, trying to up their budget. Yeah, like hey, we got a real problem to deal with here. This stuff's flooding in from California. <laughs> then him and his team just go out and buy boxes of Frito Lays every week. Look, we got more. Yeah, we won't rest till they're all gone. Yeah, hey, we need to do another uh, press conference. Let's make a Costco trip. <laughs> they, yeah. they just get one of those giant boxes full of small, individually packaged, you know, the the multi pack of chips. Mm-hmm. They just throw that up on the table. This is our latest haul. Yeah, nice. We got all these dangerous genius. drugs off the street. Yep. <laughs> oh, did the show come in for a landing? I was just gonna say. I think that yeah. <laughs> that's the the airplane schedule telling us it's time to wrap up. All right. Uh, follow us on uh, social media. Like us on Facebook, on Twitter. We are at the Weasel Four Twenty on Instagram at the Weasel Podcast. Uh, go to ChristopherMedia.net. Hit the Amazon banner and the PayPal button if you would like to help us out. And then listen to us everywhere and wherever you listen to us, rate us. Review us. That's really what helps people find us. Uh, and yeah, and stay high. Stay high. Oh. What's your emergency? Senora, me está diciendo que un tren le pegó a una camioneta? Sí, yo pensé que quería cruzar, el hijo iba rápido, creo, y después. Ay, Dios mío, qué horror. No puedes saber a qué velocidad viene un tren. Por eso están los señalamientos de advertencia. Obedécelos. Alto, el tren no para. Mensaje de Nitsa. At NJM Insurance, making our customers happy is what makes us number one. J.D. Power ranked us first in the nation for customer satisfaction with the auto insurance claims experience. Get award-winning service at NJM.com. This isn't just insurance. It's NJM.